the Bank of England, um, it started out from private interests um, and uh, it was assumed it would always sort of stay stay that way. It was two things really. The, the, the First of all, the Great Depression, the huge financial dislocations that happened from the 1930s kind of threw all the cards in the air as far as, you know, what's good for finance, how should we, you know, regulate finance and stuff like that. But of course, the big thing was the Second World War. And um, at the end of the Second World War, you had these two things came together. You had, you know, people who shed, you know, shed blood on the fields of France and Germany um, coming home and, um, you know, working class people, and they weren't going to put up with crap anymore. And there was a totally new political mood. And this was, the, this was true around the world. And you had... At the same time, the Bretton Woods institutions um, were being put together by John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White, and basically under the insight that you had had a previous era of substantial financial globalization in the 20s and before that, and that had led to the calamity of the Great Depression and the huge economic problems um, that contributed to um, to the onset of war in the end. Um, and so you had a new political mood and uh, the kind of insight that Keynes in particular had was that finance cannot be allowed to run rampant around the world. It must be constrained. It must be made to serve the needs of society. And because of the Second World War and the huge kind of sacrifices that had been made, the political will was there to actually do something about to try and constrain finance. So the period after the, the roughly 25 years after the Second World War was a period when finance under this international architecture, the Bretton Woods architecture was very much bottled up. You had capital controls, you had real, um, it was very difficult to kind of speculate across borders and things like that. It was tight, finance was very tightly constrained. And, and as it happens, that era was, it is now known as the golden era of capitalism. It is the era when there was very strong growth, much stronger than you've, growth than you've had since then, and um, falling inequality and um, it was just a kind of um, economically for many, many countries around the world, it was a great time. And the period after that, when you had financial liberalization, deregulation and everything that, um, you had a lot more crises coming, but you also had much lower economic growth and you had widening inequality. So this bottling up of finance d does seem to tell you something about the dangers of having too much finance sloshing around the world. Well, I think at the end of the day, a bank, uh, the central bank needs to serve society. I think that's what it's ultimately there for. Um, but you have had more recently uh, a finance has come to see in the central bank. Pressure has come on the central bank, uh, on the Bank of England, to serve the financial sector. Um, and uh, so there has been a kind of view that has become abroad that you you what is good for finance, what's good for the city of London, is good for Britain. Um, and that has been widely propagated. But um, so that question is always there. Um, uh, what, you know, what is the Bank of England for? Is it, try, is it trying to serve finance or is it trying to serve society? So it is very important to, um, to make it very clear what, what, what the purpose of a bank, uh, the Bank of England is. Well, the British Empire, the city of London was the kind of beating financial heart of the British Empire. Um, it was, as the historians Kane and Hopkins call it, the governor of the imperial engine. And um, it was uh, a, a great big pump. And there was this, there was this sterling zone, which um, uh, all these countries in the empire um, used to use the sterling currency. And the city of London was kind of the financier of this zone, not just inside the sterling zone, but outside the sterling zone as well. But it was this great big, it was the global financial center. Um, and so that was, so a, a lot of kind of business came to the city, not necessarily because they were best providing the best services, it just because that's who they were. That's, they were the, the big cheese. They were the ones who, who did empire and empire, the empire's finances. So in a sense, it was um, to a significant degree rent seeking, you know, it wasn't them offering the best you know, the best services necessarily, just that people came to them. So they, they were just soaking up money and they became very, very rich and powerful. Um, and after that, after the empire collapsed from the 1950s, that's when everything changed. 
So you had you had the empire collapsed in the from the early 1950s, and the gentlemen in the city were very worried about what they were going to do, how they're going to keep making money, and it was looking very bleak for them. Not only that, but you had this huge political change after the Second World War, um, when uh, you know finance was being constrained by governments around the world, and there was just this political mood that we need to give stuff back to the people, you know, working class people's inequality was falling and so on, and finance was very much bottled up. So it was a real existential crisis for the city. And the city found its new life through effectively deregulation. We're going to deregulate. We're going to allow stuff to happen here. Um, we're just going to be absolutely laissez-faire. We're going to just, um, l as light a touch as possible, we're going to allow people to bring their money here and, and do what they want, and we're going to turn a blind eye to whatever it is they want to do. That's the kind of basic model that slowly began to take over. And that became the replacement for empire. And that's why that is the most fundamental reason why the city is so powerful today. Of course, um, a lot of it is also to do with the legal system. The British legal system um, is embedded in many jurisdictions around the world um, just because of empire. And of course, that naturally makes the city a kind of place. There's a huge legal um, infrastructure here in the city, and that hasn't been another another factor. It's not just about deregulation, but the deregulation, the deregulatory um, impulse that, that began to build the city was really what has made the city um, what it is today. I think the, the uh, national, you know, when the Bank of England was nationalized, um, I think deep down, you know, the, the the institution of the Bank of England was always and remained a very conservative institution. And it, um, you know, it, it was supposed to be brought under the control of society. But at the end of the day, you have in the Bank of England technocrats, people who really know the ins and outs of what's going on. And they, they remained very conservative people who were very substantially interested in building up the financial centre and keeping the city of London as a financial centre, as a global financial centre, keeping that one going. And I think the, the, the government, when they started trying to get the Bank of England to do things that it didn't want to do, then they found that they found some very, very entrenched resistance and some very powerful technocrats who were able to sort of um, prevent certain things from happening. But uh, it was not a straightforward thing, just bringing it under, under the control of the people. Back in the 60s, the Cayman Islands was a complete backwater. And it was, um, uh, the stories go that mosquitoes were so thick in the air, sometimes they were enough to suffocate cows. That's a legend that you hear about the Cayman Islands. I don't know how true it was. But it was, there was nothing happening there. There was kind of one paved road and maybe a post office. Um, and then you had, uh, independence, um, but Cayman never became fully independent. So you had, um, it was a dependency of Jamaica, and then it kind of broke away. And the question was, um, Jamaica became independent, but the Cayman Islands decided they didn't want to cut the strings with London. So they became what are now known as overseas an overseas territory of Britain. And that's a particular relationship with Britain where um, they get a certain degree of independence, but they are still ultimately controlled by Britain and supported by Britain. So um, these small territories, the last remnants of the British Empire, which are still overseas territories today, they are still the last remnants of the British Empire. Um, there are 14 of these overseas territories. Seven of them are bona fide tax havens, including the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, um, some of the biggest tax havens in the world today are still British. Now. What happens was you had a few um, uh, specialists, a few kind of a couple of accountants would fly in, and what they realised quite quickly was um, there were some shenanigans initially going on with the, um, the, the the Netherlands Antilles, and the U.S. companies were using the Netherlands Antilles for um, for, for all sorts of purposes, um, and people in the Caribbean and other jurisdictions in the Caribbean realised they could get on in this this kind of game. Um, there was money to be made. 
So the accountants began flying in and um, there were a couple of characters, one of them called Milton Grundy, he wrote a new trust law for the Cayman Islands. And um, soon after this law was written and a couple of other laws, the airport was expanded to take um, commercial jet airliners and you had this kind of great flowering of, 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 of business activity coming to the, to the Cayman Islands. And in those days, what the Cayman Islands was doing was straightforwardly illegal activity. Um, they were, they were, drugs money was coming in in huge quantities, um, tax evasion, whatever, whatever you wanted, you could have it. You could, but you could set up these, uh, these laws and, um, and there was no, basically no consultation really with the real Caymanians. They were just happy to have business coming in. They were just, it was just a rubber stamp jurisdiction. And, and basically it was offshore interests coming in, um, and writing the laws and submitting them. Um, for approval and they would get rubber stamped through. All of these laws, in fact, because of the relationship with Britain, have to come to London for approval. They had to then and they still have to today. They have to come to the Privy Council for approval. And But Britain would just basically, almost never would it, would it veto any of this legislation. They would just say, this is fine. And um, if you look at the archives of what's, what was going on in Britain, in, in London at the time, you get these all these conversations between different departments. You have like the overseas de development um, side thinking this stuff is great because it means we don't have to give aid to, 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 to this little island because they can self-finance. So they were encouraging it. The Bank of England seemed to be rather keen on it. Um, and then you had Treasury saying, hang on chaps, this is, uh, aren't we going to lose revenue to all this tax evasion stuff? And you have all these funny sort of battles going on, but nothing was ever really done. So what happened in the Cayman Islands is that these offshore operators just kept creating new laws, setting up all the trusts and the companies and structures um, with pretty much no interference from London. London could have, could have vetoed it. And you see, if you look through the archives, you find these, these kind of nods of assent, um, kind of the Bank of England saying, okay, we, we don't mind a bit of this stuff going on um, as long as it doesn't get too out of hand, but carry on chaps, that was kind of the, the, the attitude. And this stuff was beginning to happen in various British tax havens around the world. Um, and it was very much a, um, a, a situation where nobody was really controlling it except for the financial interest, except for the private um, offshore operators, um, the people setting up the companies, the accountancy firms, the accountants setting up all this stuff. They were the ones who were driving the, driving the car. Um, and pretty much, there was pretty much no guidance, um, no interference coming from London. They were just letting it happen. The Bank of England, um, uh, you know, they had interest in things like Britain's balance of payments and things like that. And if this was stuff that brought money in um, from outside, uh, the British zone and it brought it into the UK, then, then that was kind of generally okay with them. Um, they sort of kept an eye open and, um, uh, but their attitude was generally bring the money, the money's a good thing, we're gonna just let it happen. Um, it wasn't constructed by the Bank of England, that, that's, that's pretty clear. It was just a sort of a, a tolerance, let, let's let this happen. And it flowered, it exploded in size and, the Bank of England's attitude would generally, um, I mean, there were some real ideologues at the Bank of England who were real kind of libertarians, really sort of, um, you know, I believe that exchange controls and things like that are infringements of the rights of the citizen. That's the quote from someone, um, George Bolton, who, who really saw, they were really sort of rabid free marketeers, um, uh, libertarians um, at the Bank of England. And, and, you know, so it was a kind of ideological thing as well as just, a, it wasn't just sort of, we can't be bothered to regulate them. There was an ideology that we need to um, let the private sector do what it, what it does and see what happens. That was kind of what they were doing. And um, the fact that it was bringing money in from, you know, drugs money or whatever it was, was, was absolutely fine. And it was kind of, so it was kind of, um, you know, they, they, they watched it, they let it happen, really, and, and they kind of were rather pleased with the money that was coming in as a result. Really, this was the replacement for empire. 
um, flight capital was a very, not just flight capital, but flight capital in the early days was a very important part of it. And flight capital included, um, in those days, uh, drugs money, for example. So it would, it, it's very simple. You would have um, money would come into a tax haven or money would appear to come into a tax haven. You would book it in a tax haven. So you would have a, um, a shell company a tax haven would own an asset somewhere else. It might own a, a, a building or, or a company in the United States or in Mexico or Brazil or somewhere like that. And um, that, that company would generate fees. Um, and a lot of the companies that were, that were receiving the fees and, and, and were providing the lawyers and the accountants um, to kind of do all the nuts and bolts of all this stuff, um, were British, were from the city of London. So they were, they were, you know, they had outposts in these places and these city firms were making quite a lot of money out of all this kind of business. And quite soon you started moving beyond plain vanilla, just straight tax evasion or kind of criminal hiding into more complicated kind of mergers and acquisitions and, and, and big kind of corporate stuff. Um, which would again use tax havens for all sorts of reasons, um, whether it be tax, evasion or avoidance or, or regulatory escape or whatever it was. But this stuff would become very, very big. So the Cayman Islands, for example, has, has made this kind of progression over the, over the years from this very nefarious, um, uh, straightforwardly illegal drug smuggling kind of um, pirate behavior towards kind of private equity and hedge funds and all this kind of stuff. This stuff is also very so many of the reasons why they would use somewhere like the Cayman Islands are also incredibly abusive and um, problematic and involve tax evasion and involve, um, you know, shoveling financial risks off onto other people, taking the cream, you know, all the sort of stuff that caused the crisis. But they moved in that kind of direction. Um, so, but it's always been the same sort of business model, kind of turning a blind eye to stuff, um, but moving moving away from the most you know, that kind of nefarious stuff is now being done by places like Panama and whatever. Well, the offshore satellites, so it's a kind of like, it's like layers of an onion. It's sort of the city at the center. And then the, the closest three tax haven, British tax havens, are the, the crown dependencies, Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. Um, and then outside that, you have the overseas territories, which Cayman Islands, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, and so on, out in the Caribbean and um, Gibraltar and around the world. Um, and what, they, what these places enable Britain to do, and, and further out, you have further jurisdictions that are kind of linked to Britain historically. They have, you know, many jurisdictions outside of these circles have the final court of appeal at the Privy Council in London. Um, uh, Commonwealth jurisdictions and so on. So you've got a, 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 it's it's a very big network, but the core network are these two groups: the Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories. And what they allow the city to do is to get involved in dirty business, but then when the scandal hits, to say, well, they're kind of independent. There's nothing we can do about those places. That's that's not us. That's that's tax haven activity, and we're we're the city. You know, we're we're, we're not involved in that kind of stuff. But it enables them still to be able to get involved deeply in the business but at a but to be able to to say you know this is not our stuff so it's an incredibly kind of convenient relationship and britain plays this kind of game of um pretending when it suits them to pretend that these places are independent and if you go to these places you know i went to cayman islands and watched political rallies and there's local colorful local politics and there's all sorts of arguing and shouting and stuff but at the end of the day britain um appoints the governor appoints lots of um senior people in these places they're responsible for foreign relations and defense and also they can veto their legislation as well so britain has a massive degree of control basically it is controlling these places allowing them a little bit of political space um, um, but this arrangement is so it gives the ability to say these places are kind of independent there's nothing we can do and at the moment um, as i'm saying this um, David Cameron has been saying, look, I'm going to put pressure on these places to reform and they're pushing back and saying, well, no, no, we're not going to do that. Um, the fact is, it's all about political will. If he wants to, if he really wants to, if the UK really wants to stop all this nonsense, it can do it like that. Um, 
But the political will is lacking, and that's the problem. They do have the they do have the ability to close this close these places down, as they did in the Turks and Caicos Islands in two thousand and nine, when local corruption there, which is another overseas territory, local corruption there got so out of control, they just um, imposed direct rule and uh, say, right, we're taking over. So they do have this power, but they like to keep the power hidden. I think right at the beginning, I think the Crown dependencies had been around as these sort of havens for a much longer time. They had been kind of escape routes. I mean, they'd been escape routes from all, for all sorts of things. People had gone, gone, gone to Jersey for, you know, into the previous century um, to escape political persecution, to escape um, uh, paying taxes, whatever. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a rather independent entity. So these places all always um, uh, existed. The, the, the overseas territories were kind of from the 60s onwards. That's when they really started, um, when they started kind of developing their tax haven activities, maybe from the, a little bit from the 50s, but basically from the 60s onwards. And in the beginning, they were such a small phenomenon um, that they were just seen as a kind of exotic sideshow. Those people who'd heard of them sort of didn't pay them much attention. They thought this isn't very important, and a few crooks getting involved here. Um, but I think the establishment, to begin with, didn't really know about it, didn't understand it. And, and then when there wa whenever there was pushback, it was kind of explained that this stuff was useful for various um, establishment players. Um, and it became, and it became uh, part of the, uh, part of the, uh, became part of the establishment. And it's a very interesting kind of progression because back in the 60s and 70s, you know, tax evasion or, or pushing back against taxation, tax rates were very high, um, individual tax rates, corporate tax rates. And um, it was kind of seen as anti-establishment to push back against these, ta these, these, high, these relatively high taxes. So, you know, the Rolling Stones and um, Phil Collins, all these people kind of going offshore, going away. Um, it was seen as a sort of rebellious thing to do, kind of cool and, you know, James, a lot of James Bond stuff in the Bahamas and um, uh, it just had this sort of exciting anti-establishment frisson about it. And if you fast forward to the present day, um, now that is the establishment, the offshore system is the establishment and um, uh, all this kind of um, tax dodging stuff, you know, is right, it's right at the heart of the city of London and the city is the heart of this British establishment now. It has captured um, the, the, the culturally and politically and socially and economically, it has captured the, the, the British establishment. So you've seen this kind of strange transition from um, it being a rebellion against this kind of um, relatively high tax, highly regulated system. Um, quite cool now to being something very different indeed. Well, c can I make one more sort of historical yes. kind of yes. progression? Um, one of the other things that happened uh, from the kind of 50s, 60s was a transition from what I would call the old secrecy world of tax havens, which is very much epitomized by Switzerland and Swiss bankers. Um, and, and Swiss banking was a kind of quiet, secretive, slow um, model where you take your money to a Swiss banker and he'd keep your secrets and he'd carry them to his grave. Um, and it was all about being secret, but it was it was kind of, you know, slow and stayed and sort of upper crust. What happened from the 60s onwards um, with the euro dollar markets emerging in London and that spreading out to the, to the havens was a massive change in the offshore system to a, a, a hyperactive Anglo-Saxon variant. So what we have now is the hyperactive Anglo-Saxon variety of offshore system where huge tides of money slosh through the world's financial system at high speed at the click of a computer keyboard. Um, you know, uh, tax rates here change, bosh, a load of money goes this way. Um, and, and this has huge implications for, you know, this has been at the heart of the financial globalization project. Um, so the offshore system 
often you will tend to have a secrecy structure if it has any complexity to it at all. We'll have aspects in lots of different jurisdictions, some British, some not. So very in, in China, for example, the, the, the commonest secrecy um, structure will involve uh, a company, an offshore company in Hong Kong, and then that will typically be owned by something, a trust or another company in the British Virgin Islands. BVI Hong Kong is one particular mix, and that's obviously from the Chinese joke. It sort of straddles the two zones. And I think um, uh, people often like to do that because they know that you can do investigations in one zone, but sometimes it's difficult to kind of cross that boundary and, and get an investig... You know, uh, it may be easy for the Chinese authorities to find something in Hong Kong that they wouldn't be able to find it nearly so easily in the BVI. I don't think the British um, jurisdictions are necessarily any more or less secretive than other jurisdictions. I think, um, you know, you kind of have the British zone on the one hand, uh, which is this kind of concentric circle, of these layers of the onion, but you also have the European havens, Luxembourg, Switzerland, um, Liechtenstein, and so on. You have the United States on its own. And then you have a few others which are sort of harder to categorize, um, places like Panama, which is kind of in the US orbit. Um, Mauritius is a very important rising tax haven. Dubai is another one. Um, all of these places have their own, it, it's kind of like an ecosystem. And each place offers a different kind of range of services. And you'll usually set up um, a structure that will use different aspects of this ecosystem. And if you want to get very deep secrecy, you'll go to that place. And if you want to do something to do with private equity, you'll go you know, to the Cayman Islands or Jersey. Um, and, but I don't think the British system is necessarily any more, is any more secretive than, than the others. Um, it's just in, different. In terms of the actual structures that they offer? Well, I think one of the things about the British system, one of the things that is most important, um, there are lots of different kind of flavors of secrecy. Swiss banking secrecy is the most famous, the most well-known. You know, you put your money in a Swiss bank and they won't, they promise not to tell anybody. And that's one kind of secrecy. But another kind of secrecy, which is very British, which is the most British kind, is the trust. And the trust is a very um, slippery, complicated and devious mechanism, um, which has many legitimate uses, but it also can create secrecy that is stronger than Swiss banking secrecy. Um, it can create absolutely impenetrable forms of secrecy and um, allow you to avoid your taxes and stuff like that. So the, the British trust sector is, is, is really big, the, the kind of in, te in technical terms is probably the biggest British contribution to this and that is a very, very, that is a huge area that is extremely difficult to tackle. Um, you will typically have, a, an offshore structure will often have a trust kind of sitting at the top of it. In other words, the trust will be here managing the assets, kind of controlling the assets. Underneath it, the trust will own some shell companies. Each one might be in a different jurisdiction. So you might have a trust in one jurisdiction whose trustees are somewhere else, whose beneficiaries are somewhere else, which owns offshore companies somewhere else. Each of these companies might then own assets. So that they might own you know, a bank account, a racehorse, a yacht, a painting, um, a portfolio of shares or whatever. So you'll often have this structure, but the trust will, will often be at the top. And that is because trusts, particularly offshore trusts, are incredibly flexible things. They allow you to do all sorts of things. And what they really, what they're, they are all about is about ownership. They're about manipulating how assets are owned. Um, and ownership isn't very isn't a straightforward thing. Um, it's about you know the, the the right to control an asset can be separated out from the the, the right to enjoy the benefits of the asset, and um, so you can separate all different aspects of, of ownership with 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 trusts. So a trust. Um, Trusts emerged, the legend has it, from the time of the Crusades when the knights would go off and fight in foreign lands and they would leave their assets in the care of trusted stewards who would look after those assets and manage them on behalf of the beneficiaries, which would usually be their family. So the, 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 the knight, the settlor, gives away the asset into the trust. The trustee looks after those assets. Um, 
and then looks out after them on behalf of the beneficiaries. Maybe the family wasn't up to managing a you know, b b b bunch of assets properly, so the trustee would look after them, um, and it would be cattle or uh, buildings or whatever. Um, but a body of law developed around this concept, and now it is this three-way split. You have someone who might be a rich old grandfather giving money um, into a trust, which will be managed by a lawyer typically, um, under a set of instructions that will say, here are the beneficiaries, my children, for example. Um, that's a typical trust structure. But the thing about um, trust is once you've given away the assets, legally speaking, you've kind of separated yourself from, from those assets. Um, and once you've separated yourself from those assets, you're not going to be on any piece of paper anyway. You're, they're gone. Now, the deviousness with offshore trust in particular is that you can kind of pretend to give away the assets into the trust, but then you find clever ways to get the money back. Um, back to yourself. but um, So it's not your money anymore, but in fact you do have the power to enjoy um, the, the money that you know you can you can get loans from from what, what the trust owns and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So it's a very sort of devious um, slippery structure. And so um, a very common kind of trust um, called a discretionary trust is where you have, so you have a range of beneficiaries, they haven't received the money yet. Um, they will receive, each one of them might receive some money under certain conditions, but until they do actually receive something, none of those beneficiaries is yet entitled, can say, I am entitled to that money, because it's not certain yet. So if they're not entitled to it, um, they don't have any ownership over these assets. The money has been given away into the trust, the beneficiaries haven't received anything, nor are they entitled to receive anything. So you have this, these assets sitting in limbo. They're sitting offshore. They're earning income but not being taxed because they're offshore. Um, and so you have all these assets. There are trillions and trillions of US dollars worth of assets sitting out there owned by trusts, um, much of which, which are in this kind of limbo. And very difficult for tax authorities and criminal authorities to grapple with this kind of thing because at the end of the day there is this relationship. There are, you know, the owner, the person who gave the money away, does have some measure of control still over this, over what's going on, and the beneficiaries do have some beneficial interest. But legally speaking, they can say it's not mine, it's not mine, nothing to do with me. So they aren't taxed on it. Well, I think trusts are incredibly common vehicles. Um, for all sites, all sorts of, um, I would call them abuses, because when you get this ambiguity about whether something has been given away or not, whether something's been received or not, um, you then get into the question of whether or not it's legal. And quite often, the question of whether what's going on is legal or not is a matter for a court to decide. You can't say that's illegal tax evasion or that's tax avoidance. Um, it gets very complicated. And um, a lot of it is put deliberately into a gray area. And huge amounts of um, abusive activities and, and you know, assets held, held in kind of um, contempt of taxpayers elsewhere um, are, are held through trust for that precise reason, to create this ambiguity, to allow people to um, operate with a relative degree of impunity. If you've been separated from your assets legally, then you can do all sorts of stuff and you can you know, you can separate yourself from, from that. And, and it's not just tax evasion or, 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 or financial crime. And often people do it to protect themselves against creditors. So fraudsters, people who've committed a fraud, they want to take their winnings. And then when the balloon goes up, keep their winnings. So if they can get it into a sufficiently strong trust structure, um, uh, they can often protect themselves against, against, you know, the courts will come after them and say, well, that's not mine, that's somebody else's. You know, I've given it away. So the courts find it very difficult to get their hands on, you know, and the creditors who, who've been screwed over find it very difficult to get their hands on those assets. So there's a lot of that kind of activity goes on. Yeah. Well, the British relationship is fundamentally important to these places, um, uh, essentially because they are, they are bedrock. Um, uh, just a, a little story. Um, about the Bahamas, which is not an overseas territory. The Bahamas used to be, this is where Al Capone put a lot of it, putting a lot of his stuff back in the 30s and 40s. And um, uh, uh, after, you know, it was Cuba and then the, the Bahamas. But then the Bahamas became independent. And so much, there was a lot of offshore activity, not just Al Capone, but all sorts of offshore activity. When Bahamas became independent, 
off it all went to the nearby Cayman Islands. And one of the lawyers there said, it wasn't that the president of Bahamas did anything wrong, it was just that he was black. And the fact that the Cayman Islands was a British, still a British territory, that made all the difference. And so Britain, you have this kind of legal bed, bed, bedrock. So you have British courts um, operating out of the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, um, that are, uh, they are properly British courts and appeal is to London. And so people, um, you know, ol Russian oligarchs or whoever will be wanting to have their, their structures held by these British, um, these British jurisdictions because they know that if they get into litigation with one of their enemies, they can go to court and it will be a British court. It won't be a, some, uh, you know, uh, poorly un understaffed, corruptible court. It'll be a proper British court. So that's... So because of Britain's, this British bedrock, that is what has allowed these places to become so trusted by the financial services industry and, and offshore finance and all these people. They just trust, you know, it, it's a kind of sort of double-edged thing that trust creates. On the one hand, it creates a trust that, you know, the way I summarize what part of the offshore business model is that um, the, the tax havens make this offering that goes something like this. It's like, you can trust us not to steal your money, but you can also trust us to turn a blind eye. So we don't care what, you know, you can steal someone else's money, that's fine, but we won't steal your money. Bring us your money, we won't steal it. But if you want to steal someone else's, you can get up to what you like and we'll turn a blind eye to that. So um, the fact this British bedrock has been absolutely fundamental to the success of these places because it has reassured investors from around the world. They don't want to put their money in. There have been you know, African countries that have tried to set up tax havens, um, Kenya, Botswana, Ghana. Um, they've generally not worked out and it's largely because you know, um, they're, not, they're no longer British colonies. But these overseas territories, these crown dependencies still have this relationship with Britain and that's what reassures investors um, that they're not going to have their money nicked. Yeah, the, 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 the relationship that these places have with London is, is very much um, about the British establishment and people understanding each other. I mean, anybody who knows, who is British or knows a British, British people knows that communication between us is often very subtle and you have to kind of know the codes when people say stuff. I mean, a lot of irony involved and um, a lot of um, kind of codified language for the British establishment that um, people kind of understand how it works. And I think that is very much the case with the British relationship with the tax havens. I think there's a lot of understanding of what we can and can't do without anyone having to actually spell it out. Um, uh, and also a lot of networks of trust, a lot of networks of, um, uh, if you come from the same kind of background, you know the right people, then all the kind of legal niceties of, um, will, will often fall away. You can get away with doing all sorts of things that they wouldn't just let any old person, you know, if you came knocking on the door saying, can you set up an offshore company to do this, they'd tell you to get lost. But if you're part of the networks, you can, you can do these kinds of things. Um, so that's a very important part of the, um, part of the whole system. Um, this, you know, upper class British public school kind of um, establishment that has been there since, you know, for centuries. Um, and that's still very much alive in the tax havens. Well, one could one could argue that that um, these places are part of a second British Empire. Uh, the you know the, the, when the formal empire collapsed, it was replaced by something new, and the, the something new kind of has two parts. One is the 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 the, 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 the rapidly deregulating city of London at the centre, um, uh, bringing in um, activity, particularly financial activity from Wall Street. They were constrained by New Deal regulation, um, Glass-Steagall Act, things like that, that were preventing Wall Street banks from doing all sorts of things they, <clears throat> they wanted to do. Um, finance was very much being kind of bottled up in the, in the, after the Second World War. In London, they created, they allowed this new kind of activity, this 
euro markets to emerge that was a kind of deregulated um, space where the banks would come and do in London what they weren't allowed to do at home. And this grew explosively. So that's one kind of part um, of, of this system. And the other part is the satellite tax havens um, out there uh, allowing this stuff, this stuff to happen. So this is kind of the two, part, two parts of the system. Very much, it was not so much a sort of national decision, let's do this. It was uh, the City of London, um, they started doing this. The city players started doing this. Um, and the offshore players piled in. And it just exploded. And the Bank of England, which um, was supposed to oversee this sector, very much took a back seat. And so it wasn't so much a deliberate strategy of uh, let's do this um, at the beginning. It was, you know, the, 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 the private sector players came in and started doing it. Bank of England saw that this was generating um, balance of payments, um, benefits for Britain. Uh, the politicians were all arguing about whether this stuff was disreputable and um, or whether it was a good thing. Money was coming in. But as this was happening, more and more money was coming in and um, the city just started to, it was a kind of rebirth of the city. So. Um, and because it kind of spans the globe, you could, you know, all this money coming in. So Britain kind of, you know, the soldiers left, the, the administrators left all the colonies, but they still kept a significant degree of control over the financial flows from these former, um, the former parts of empire in the rest of the world. So you could say it's a kind of, you could describe it as a second empire, um, Britain's second empire, sort of hidden financial empire spanning large parts of the globe, um, with, you know, money flows coming into the city of London. If you were feeling cynical, you could call it a second empire, um, which I think is a fair, a fair thing to say. But the other interesting thing is that if you look at when the euro market started, the really very first flowering of it, the very beginning of it was 1956. That was the year of the Suez Crisis, and that was the year that if you were going to mark any year was the year when the British Empire collapsed or began to collapse. That was when it happened. So there's a real coincidence of timing. And it is a bit of a coincidence um, that you'd have the collapse of empire and the emergence of this new thing. But um, after that, you had this new British financial system emerged. Um, so one empire kind of gave, gave way to another. I think by developing this completely new financial market and by being at the heart of global, like financial globalization, I think um, Britain has played a very important role in the way that global markets work. Um, I think a lot of this stuff enables financial players and you know the owners of assets and capital to uh, shake off the burdens of society that they don't like. They just shake off taxes, shake off financial regulation, shake off disclosure, transparency requirements, um, and enable them. So if you're talking about large multinational corporations, for example, which use the offshore system to cut their tax bills, it means that they can outcompete small businesses um, and they can kill them in markets um, on a factor tax that has nothing to do with you know real productivity or economic efficiency or anything like that it's simply about engineering a transfer away from taxpayers towards the multinationals um, and you know so they free riding on on the services paid for by everybody else they're free riding on the rule of law and the courts and the police and the and the the, the roads and the infrastructure and educated workforces um, and then they're not paying for it so this is a very sort of unproductive thing thing that's happening, what the multinationals are doing. But the fact that they're also able to kill their market, their competitors, their smaller, more locally based competitors in markets on this factor, um, is again distorting markets. It's tipping the playing field. It means that big becomes bigger, small becomes smaller, more kind of monopolistic behavior, more, um, uh, and of course, more inequality. Um, uh, you know, wealth, cascading upwards. Um, you know, this system, the offshore system in many different ways has engineered an enormous transfer of wealth upwards. Um, as the US tax writer once put it, it's not trickle down anymore, it's Niagara up. And that is very much um, what the system has been doing. It has been creating 
all sorts of avenues for for the wealthiest players to to basically get other people to pay for what they're what they're doing and to take the cream, shovel the risks and the costs onto everybody else. So, yeah, if you take vulture funds, for example, they will, um, you'll have, um, you know, a, a, a country will go and will, will borrow a bunch of money and it, it'll, it'll owe uh, a lot of money. And so there'll be these debts that become tradable. Um, they can, they can, they can, um, th these debt, when, when these debts get, get traded, if a country appears like a basket case, like it can't repay this money, those debts become very, very cheap. And so vulture funds come in and they buy up these debts and the most well-known cases with um, Elliot and against Argentina. They buy the debts very cheaply and then they try and influence matters so that the governments do actually... They're, they're, these debts are very cheap because people don't expect the money to be repaid. But then if they can buy the debts and then influence what's going on in the country um, that isn't repaying... So that they do, so that they do engineer repayment, then they're laughing. They're, they're going to get the cream. So, um, one way of doing this is to uh, use use a tax haven to um, uh, to hide the assets of some public officials in this country, um, and saying, you know, if we, if you manage to pull the right political leader, leader levers, so that this repayment is made. Uh, we'll shovel some money into your offshore bank account and keep it. You, know, you can keep it secret, and the tax haven will keep that um, keep that payment secret. So, and then, so you know, and, and, and that has surely been done on many occasions. Um, you know, you, you buy this debt cheap, influence the public officials, give them a big payoff into a tax haven. They pull the levers, government repays in full. And they've made a fortune. Um, so that's just one example of the kind of insider behaviour that, that, that tax havens can engineer. Um, they can rig, mar you know, you can rig markets. You can do anything. Hide, hide the proceeds offshore. Hide all the shenanigans. Hide the bribes um, offshore. And you can, you can loot countries um, using the, the offshore system. Yeah, there's an incredible ruthlessness about the offshore system. I mean, it is a deliberate, you know, these places are deliberately set up to engineer these transfers um, of wealth away from taxpayers, away from creditors, away from whoever, towards the insiders, towards the elite. And it is a very ruthless game that's being played um, and has been played since the beginning of the offshore system. And very cynical um, in, you know, it's, it, it is a cynical anti-democratic and ruthless system. Yes, I would say there is, uh, there is very much an offshore mentality. And, and because these places are about stripping away regulations, stripping away tax um, from the clients, from the usually wealthy clients, um, taking away the responsibilities of society, they are very kind of, um, on the one hand, they tend to be very anti-tax. You know, I've had debates with some of these practitioners in public spaces, and they—you should hear their their language that they use to talk about high-tax countries and how it's just cut taxes and everything will be fine. So there's a real tax-cutting agenda. There's a real liberalisation agenda. Real kind of very right-wing. These places are very, very right-wing jurisdictions, um, and um, but very libertarian as well. You know, we want freedom, which sounds great. You know, just take away all these rules and regulations, let people do what they want, and um, it was a very libertarian thing. But you must always remember with with this that um, it is always, nearly always, the wealthiest sections of society. This is this is freedom um, for one small group of, of the most wealthy and powerful people. Um, you know, it is, in a sense, it is, is also the freedom of the fox in the hen house. It is the freedom of them to, if they want to, you know, usually there are laws, you know, rules and regulations are put in place for good reason, good democratic reasons, um, for all the problems that are involved. Um, you know, there are reasons for having financial regulations and not allowing people to do certain things. Take your money or activity to these places, and um, these rules and regulations are taken away, and it's it's all about turning turning a blind eye. So, this kind of libertarian attitude is very much about um, letting 
the wealthiest people get what they want. Um, so it is, yeah, it is a very right-wing libertarian um, kind of kind of place. And often, you know, you just talk to these people, they live in these kind of bubbles. They're little tiny offshore bubbles. You know, the Cayman Islands are t a very small community there. And they all talk to each other and they often don't sort of talk to people in the outside world so much. And, they, and, and these kind of mentalities, nobody sort of questions them. And, they, and, and some of the things they say are just, you know, they sound to us sound outrageous. You know, the, the, these, I remember talking to a guy in Switzerland, um, a banker who was saying, you know, France and Germany are illegitimate states because they tax their citizens too much and, and blah, blah, blah. So these attitudes are very kind of very pervasive throughout the offshore system. Well, generally, I think whistleblowers the world over have a hard time, but I think they have an especially hard time in the tax havens or secrecy jurisdictions, um, because again, they, you know, these places they, they they will protect the interests of the of the money of the wealthy wealthiest elites. Um, that's what their business model is: bring your money to us, we'll keep it safe. So you don't want whistleblowers coming in. You know, it's just um, another form of secrecy. Really, is to is to to nail whistleblowers. So the Cayman Islands, for example, has a confidential is a law called the Confidential Relationships Preservation Law, um, which under which you can go to prison for several years, not just for divulging confidential information, but just for asking for it. Um, Switzerland has gone so far, there is a, a well-known whistleblower there, Rudolf Elmer, who was working for Julius Baer, Swiss Bank in the Cayman Islands. Um, uh, he was their chief financial officer and he blew the whistle on all kinds of nasty stuff that was going on there. He has been, he and his family have been persecuted for the last 10 years. The courts are going after him. I've looked at his case in detail and the, and the the, the 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 court case and 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 it's clear to me that the judges um, and the prosecutors um, pursuing him have not been following Swiss law. They have not been applying Swiss law correctly. They have basically corrupted the courts to try and nail him. And that's how important it's been to the Swiss banking establishment to 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 squash whistleblowers. Um, Luxembourg recently. There's a there's a another famous whistleblower called. And Antoine Del Tour, who exposed some uh, some corporate tax documents, uh, a big scandal that became known as LuxLeaks. Um, he is now being pursued, and the journalist that was involved initially in, in in these revelations are being pursued aggressively by the Luxembourg courts and by PwC, the um, the the company, the accounting firm that. Um, that what, you know, it's their data that, that he exposed, but but it, it's very aggressive stuff. It really is important to their business models to to nail whistleblowers and to you know make sure nobody blows the whistle on this stuff because it, it 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 really is you know the antithesis of what what they're all about. Well, what you get is a lot of these a lot of these countries are small. Small jurisdictions, small islands, typically, but you have some bigger places like Switzerland that's got you know seven or eight million population. Um, but generally, these are very small jurisdictions you're talking about. And in these small places, you get um, uh, the, the capture of these jurisdictions by f offshore financial services is quite easy. You you capture not only the legislature, the, the lawmaking facilities, but you kind of capture the sort of cultural the whole cultural kind of milieu. You capture the media, make sure that there's no real dissent. Um, and if you go to some of these places, you will find in the media there's very, very little criticism of, uh, often no criticism, criticism at all of what's going on in the offshore center and you know very angry kickbacks. And any attack on these places is viewed as an attack, not on the, on the financial sector, but on the whole island. Um, so, uh, so this kind of stuff, so it becomes very, very difficult to speak out. You get this very sort of um, financial, offshore financial consensus, very strong consensus that builds up and everybody buys into it. You know, they read the same newspapers and we need this stuff, it's good for us, it brings the money. Um, and, it, it, and it takes real courage to speak out um, against this consensus. I spoke to one whistle, whistleblower in a tax haven um, who now says that her own sister crosses the street rather than 
rather than come come anywhere near her because she once blew the whistle on something and she's been so severely um, uh, ostracized by that tiny little society that um, you know it's it's broken up her own family and these things become very very personal. In terms of the levers that they pull, the commonest lever is um, in these places, particularly in the small places. They're generally the only employment op op opportunities, apart from you know maybe some maybe tourism, will be either in the offshore financial centre or in the government. And if you speak out against this stuff, everybody will know who you are. You'll never work in the offshore financial centre again, and you'll never work in the government again either, because everyone there knows who you are, and they're, they're kind of symbiotic. And so. Career-wise, you're committing career suicide um, to to speak out against this stuff. So that's a that's a kind of cultural. Um, it's a kind of all-encompassing consensus that that has penalties if you if you transgress. So those who do blow the whistle on this stuff really are, um, you know, tend to be very brave people. They tend to be, um, uh, you know. People who have a lot of difficulty afterwards and often have to leave the jurisdiction, go somewhere else. These, I mean, the, 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 the penalties that were, you know, this is not, you know, the capture and the consensus and the penalties against sort of transgressors. These are, these are very, very wealthy and sophisticated people who are doing this. So it's not going to be, you know, it's not generally let's slam them in prison. That's far too crude. We are talking about very substantially, you know, the establishment, the British establishment in, in these cases. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the mechanisms are very, very subtle. Um, you know, uh, sort of ostracism is, is, is one way of doing it. Um, and these, yeah, these, these peculiar mechanisms for, you know, if someone tries to, to blow the whistle, you find all sorts of methods that aren't the most, you know, just fire them, you give them far too much work to do, you steer them in a different direction. There are many, many different subtle, sophisticated mechanisms for, for stopping all this sort of stuff. You know, pressure on the family, that's another not another one that, that happens. Um, uh, it, it's very, very difficult to fight against this thing um, in one of these places. I, I think people I'd, for people often offshore, the boundaries are pretty clear to them. They know either they can speak to me or they can't. Um, when I went to the Cayman Islands um, back in 2008, I think it was, um, I had you know I'd gone ahead in advance and, and contacted a lot of people saying I'm coming and I'd like to interview various people for this book I'm writing. And um, initially they said okay, yeah, and they put me in touch with all sorts of you know very senior people come and interview them. And when I got there. I spoke. I called the government spokesman. And he said, "Okay, we have had an order from on high that nobody is allowed to speak to you. You are off limits. We're not going to um, uh, give you interviews." And um, you know, because they'd finally worked. You know, they'd finally understood that I was working with the Tax Justice Network. I mean, I told him, and they kind of um, uh, they took a decision, an executive decision. He said, "This has been taken at the highest level. Um, we're just not going to talk to you because you are hostile to tax havens." And um, which was, uh, you know, made it difficult to begin with, but it just meant I went and dug up a bunch of other people um, who all turned out to be very interesting indeed, and I got just a different set of stories. Um, I think there are a lot of people, I think a lot of people in the past, this stuff wasn't really being discussed very much. Ten years ago, there wasn't much discussion about tax havens um, out there. And a lot of people just got on with their jobs. They kind of, some of them felt a bit uneasy. Now there's a lot more stuff that's kind of in your face that what's happening here is bad. And I think there are a lot of people who, um, who feel uncomfortable with what they're doing. And you know, I, you know, there are a fair few number of people in banks and elsewhere who, who are very happy to chat and just to get stuff off their chest. Um, generally, they won't spill specific secrets about this person has done that, but they will talk about what it's like and what kind of incentives they have and how difficult it is and um, uh, uh, yeah things that are you know thing, things that are going on I think people feel often feel better sort of you know talking about this to someone who isn't just part of that bubble because a lot of them just sort of live in this bubble and they talk to these people and they find it quite frustrating that they live in such a kind of uh, 
right-wing rabid media and there are a lot of perfectly decent people working offshore um, who either don't kind of think too hard about it or they um, or they uh, just feel uncomfortable but you know their families in you know private school and they've got to pay you know they just have they need the money and so they kind of force themselves to do it so but it is hard you know it is a play you know secrecy you know these are secrecy places and you know you can ring up people and interview them like and they say oh well i can tell you this this is how it works i can't tell you who did you know who did what so getting specifics is very very difficult indeed um for a journalist or an investigator who isn't a kind of doesn't have a court order in their hands um it's very difficult to get specific information about you know who's done what where the bodies are buried Well, you know, funnily, when I wrote Treasure Islands, um, it was uh, it was very new, the analysis. I mean, it, it was, you know, a few people were making the analysis and I was working with people in doing Treasure Islands, but th that analysis has not been sort of put out there in a package before. And I was expecting a lot more kickback than I got. You know, I was very nervous when it was published. Am I going to get sued? Am I going to get um, people saying, oh, you've got this wrong, you've got that wrong, you've got that wrong? Um, and apart from with a few small exceptions, basically the kickback that came wasn't, you got it wrong, you're an idiot. Except for this one guy in the Cayman Islands who you mentioned, a guy called Anthony Travers, who absolutely loathes me. And he, um, uh, he gave all these interviews saying, Mr. Shaxon is an idiot and he doesn't know what he's talking about. But, but he was the only one, he never got into specifics. He never said he's wrong because of this, 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 apart from, um, Oh, taxes, you know, he would say taxes are terrible and Mr. Shackson wants high taxes. And, you know, these old arguments they will, they will come back with. But um, in terms of specifics, I just didn't get the kickback that I was, I was fearing. Didn't say people say you got this wrong. Um, and I think the whole sort of tax justice movement that has been campaigning against tax havens and particularly in, on the secrecy side has been kind of pushing against an open door. Um, we have, you know, in the beginning, we made all these recommendations, you know, we must have um, automatic information exchange, various kind of technical solutions to these issues. And in the beginning, everybody kind of laughed at us, say, you'll never get that, that's impossible. And But now a lot of these things are kind of G20 policy to push, push for this stuff. So, and, and the reason for that is really that there is no, um, there is no counter argument. The, the argument against these things is political power, you know, the wealthiest people in society don't want this. But if you try and argue, if you sit at a dinner table and argue these points with anybody, they will not be able to, you know, defeat your arguments. So the arguments were kind of quite easy to win. Um, you know, this stuff is bad. Tax abuses, secrecy, all this sort of stuff needs to be rolled back. You can win those arguments pretty easily. Um, what is pushing back is the raw power and 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 also technical complexity, um, you know, you push back against something and squirrely ways will be found around them. Yeah. Um, but that's basically, uh, so, I, so, so that's, kind of the, uh, that's kind of the way things have gone. You know, there's been a sort of, people have been waking up very quickly to, to, to what's going on and there hasn't been um, the, the, the pushback that I expected. Well, I went to Jersey and I gave interviews to BBC Jersey. They didn't broadcast it. Um, uh, the BBC in Jersey is uh, captured like uh, like all the other media outlets in Jersey. They are very uncritical. They um, you know they are suffused with the consensus. I mean, it's kind of surprises a lot of people, but they will they will report uncritically what the offshore financial sector players will say. Um, and uh, yeah, you know the the. the Tax Justice Network, John Christensen, has a standing offer to, to the, you know, the top financial people in Jersey, let's have a public debate. Um, they've never taken, taken us up on the offer of having a public debate. Um, I don't know why, don't know, uh, you know, they're, they're, obviously I think they are afraid that the arguments will be very difficult for them to, to win in a public, in a public place. But, but I think, you know, uh, it is hard for the for the, for the um, uh, you know captured media organisation to interview a what they would regard as a dissident or, or regard as a you know someone who's beyond the pale, someone who speaks things which should not be spoken.
Aha, the libel laws. Well, actually, things have changed. Um, things have changed a bit for the better than they used to be. But um, British libel law has, for years, been for decades, been horrific. Um, you know, journalists who libel a wealthy and powerful person risk losing vast sums. You know, risk losing their shirts. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. And when I wrote Treasure Islands, as with previous books, I've had, um, you know, libel. So you sit for a long time with the libel lawyers and they go through it very carefully. Like, Can you say this? And and then they have to calculate, you know, what's the percentage chance that they're going to sue you for saying that and um, how, you know, and demonstrate that this is correct and how litigious are these people and um, how aggressive are they and all these kind of things for each sort of contentious point. It wasn't such a big problem for me because Treasure Islands is not so much an investigative digging into particular people's shenanigans. That's where you get into the real libel libel issues. It was more of a kind of uh, trying to expose the system and how it works. Um, so that doesn't, you know, exposing a system doesn't expose you to libel. It's that when you go after a particular person and make sort of accusations against them. Um, but a lot of digging in these, you know, uh, a lot of these people are, you know, because they're so wealthy, they can just, you know, they will retain a lawyer who will, for a fee, write fire off a letter to you saying, you know, we're going to take you to court if you don't retract that statement. Um, and sometimes they do, and it's it's horrific. So, you know, these are again protections for for wealth and power, um, courtesy of the UK. But you know, there has been some libel law reform recently that has made things somewhat better. But it's still, uh, you know, a scary business. The City of London Corporation is a peculiar creature um, that combines, um, on the one hand, a local authority for the square mile in geographically at the centre of London um, with a, a kind of old boys network, a formal old boys network. So there's a whole official network at the heart of the City of London Corporation um, as part of this, um, uh, part of this, this body. Uh, and it has, lo you know, it has over a hundred livery companies, and these livery companies include the Worshipful Company of Tax Advisors, um, which uh, contains, you know, if you look at who's in this Worshipful Company, um, you'll see some of the biggest names in tax. Um, and so you have this local authority, this kind of old boys network, and is also combined. There's a lobbying function. The Lord Mayor of the City of London, who is not the same as the Mayor of London. The Mayor of London looks after the whole Greater London, you know, the whole London metropolis. The Lord Mayor of the City of London is responsible for the square mile. But one of his official roles also is to lobby and proselytize for freedom for finance, um, for the financial sector, um, and to, you know, fight back regulation, look after the interests of, of financial institutions, um, and to travel around the world, um, kind of lobbying for financial deregulation. It's a remarkable, there's no way of describing what this thing is really. And it's these different things. There's, there's nothing else like it in the world. This, um, this sort of lobbying organization with a local authority, with a, with a, with an old boys network. Um, but this, um, and, 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 you know, the, the history of the city of London, it goes back a thousand years. It goes back to the time of William and the Conqueror and before. Um, and this body has has represented the interests of finance. Um, and it has become confused with the interests of finance. So at the moment, these days, when people say the city, it kind of means two things. One is the city of London, which means the financial services sector of the UK that is in the city of London and um, in the square mile. It is also in Canary Wharf. It is also, you know, you, there's some in Edinburgh and whatever. That's financial services. That's referred to as the city. But there's also the City of London Corporation, which is another city, which is this strange creature. Um, and it is very much um, part of the British establishment. And there's, um, it has its own peculiar um, constitutional relationships with with the rest of the UK. It's not completely the same. It's not a normal local authority. It has its own voting system, um, which generally does not involve political parties. It's um, all the people um, who stand for election tend to tend to stand as independents. Um, there is a corporate vote. In other words, large corporations located in the City of London 
get a certain um, quota of votes um, that they they can um, that are supposed to represent their workforce, but they basically vote for vote in city elections. So it is this very peculiar peculiar creature um, that people in Britain don't really know much about. The main way they would know about it is that the Lord Mayor gives a Lord Mayor's show every year, which is full of pomp and ceremony and golden carriages and stuff and funny clothes. And um, uh, but it is it is right at the heart of the of the British establishment um, and has been for hundreds of years. Basically, finance has, I would say, finance has captured government. It is very difficult for, you know, British, British government is a huge, complicated thing. Britain is a big, boisterous democracy. So, you know, the, the capture is only up to a point. Um, but it is very hard these days for, um, for, I mean, I think one of the great markers for this is trying to look at how many bankers have gone to jail for all the massive oceans of crime and fraud and, market rigging and abuses that have been going on. Um, uh, I saw a statistic the other day that the, the US savings and loan disa loans disaster of the 1970s, 1980s, um, something like 880 bankers went to jail in the US after that. Um, in Britain, nobody goes to jail. No bankers go to jail. They generally don't. Um, uh, they are a protected species. They do not... Um, there are no consequences for them when when the global financial crisis happens. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes they lose their jobs and stuff like that, and the banks go bust and stuff like that. But but really, the establishment protects them, and they have been, and that is part of the offshore business model of the UK: is to say, we will protect you, we will bring your money here, we will look after you. We're not going to put you in prison. We'll let you do what you want um, when the balloon goes up. When taxpayers ride to the rescue, someone else is going to pay for that. You're not going to pay for it, and and that's part of the and that's why so many bankers like coming to London. Um, that's one of the reasons why so many bankers like coming to London because they get this astonishing protection. Um, and there has been a substantial capture of the media as well, and in in the UK uh, by the financial sector, uh, it is quite hard. You know, of course, there's lots of criticism, particularly since the financial crisis. But how much has changed since then in real terms? Not that much. There's been a bit more regulation. But now, you know, as I speak, there's a lot of talk of, OK, the anger is beginning to die down. Let's just let things go back to how they were. Um, and so, yeah. Tax havens, offshore financial centres, they facilitate all manner of abuses. They facilitate market rigging. Uh, they facilitate monopolies. They f facilitate tax evasion. They facilitate financial crime, fraud, um, often using secrecy, but often using loopholes and escape routes and things like that. Um, so. Fighting against this stuff is fighting against all of those things. Trying to put a stop to to, to what these offshore centres are doing is 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 to fight against all these different ills and evils that um, are causing rising inequality. That are causing a breakdown, democratic breakdown, a loss of faith in democracy, um, as people perceive that there's one set of rules for the rich and powerful and another set of rules for everybody else. Um, all of these incredibly fundamental things are, um, you know, these breakdowns and these problems are substantially caused by the offshore system. And so fighting against, you know, th this, this system is a way to try and defend uh, democracy and, uh, you know, economic justice and fairness and things like that. In, in developing countries, the offshore system of tax havens has facilitated the looting of these countries by their elites. Um, it has enabled them to take the money, or, you know, steal the money and keep it safe somewhere else. And the looting of countries and corruption that is involved in this kind of process 
has been a significant driver of conflict um, uh, in many countries. I mean, look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, that has been uh, for, for, for years, for decades, has been suffering conflicts and fighting and corruption and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, it is intimately tied in with the looting of Congo's mineral wealth and the, the, you know, the hiding of the proceeds. Offshore is never the only part of the story. There's always, and there are always many other reasons for these problems, because offshore is elsewhere. So it is, it is, you know, the stuff that's happening here is one thing. The, the stuff that's happening off offshore is another. But offshore is always a part of the story. And if you take pretty much any sort of major economic development in the last um, few decades you will find an offshore angle to it. Nearly every multinational corporation has a number of offshore subsidiaries for one reason or another. Um, uh, every bank has got hundreds of, every big global bank has hundreds of offshore um, subsidiaries. Financial globalization offshore has been at the center of that. Um, the looting of Africa offshore has been at the center of that. You know, you look at, um, uh, corruption in, you know, uh, France, Germany, Italy, Silvio Berlusconi, I mean, all of these have got huge, huge offshore elements to them because that's where you hide the money. Um, so it's everywhere and um, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's of fundamental importance. Well, I think I think the British system has um, it's always been a problem. Is it too big? It's always been too big. I think the offshore part of it um, it's been a problem since since the beginning. It it has got in terms of Britain um, politically, barring another crisis of the scale of the global financial crisis, um, it's very hard to see politically how one would overturn what's been going on. How would one would overturn what's been going on in the city? And, um, and in the offshore satellites. There has been some pushback and there have been some improvements um, made in some areas. There have been things that got worse in other areas. I mean, in Britain's case and the British satellites, there, has been, there have been some improvements made in, a tra in, in terms of secrecy, but in terms of tax, Britain has kind of been going in the other direction. Things have been getting worse. Um, more corporate tax loopholes um, have been allowed and encouraged and Britain, you know, Britain has been playing this ridiculous Competitive, so-called competitive tax policy to try and, um, you know, shower goodies on corporations to try and get them in the vain hope that they're going to come and relocate to the UK. So there's been that going in 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 one direction. Um, but it, you know, it is possible to affect change, and there has been some change. But it all depends, at the end of the day, on political will, and that depends on voters getting interest in this and and getting angry about it. One of my preferred ways of trying to see if a tax haven is a tax haven is whether they deny, whether they feel the need to deny being a tax haven. All tax havens deny being tax havens. The Cayman Islands, we're not a tax haven. Switzerland, we're not a tax haven. Panama, no, we're not a tax haven. British Virgin Islands, but etc. The list goes on and on. They all deny. They've all got an industry of tax haven deniers. It's not, we're not a tax haven. We're a responsible finan international financial centre is the term they like to use. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that tax havens hate a taint. They hate being tainted with this word because money, the world's kind of hot money, these huge tides of trillions of dollars of capital is very flighty and frisky and um, it won't go to a jury. You know, it, it will be discouraged from going to a jurisdiction that has some sort of taint. They want to go to places that seem kind of squeaky clean. Um, and so there's this whole kind of charade, this whole kind of theater is put on of we are clean, we are not a tax haven, we are, you know, who are these idiots calling us, calling us dirty, look at our rules, look at our regulations. Meanwhile, all these kind of shenanigans are going on. So um, it was very important for the tax havens that David Cameron would say something like that. These are not tax havens anymore. And lo and behold, in all their newspapers, look, we're not tax havens anymore. David Cameron says so. Very useful for them, um, uh, that kind of thing. But it's all about... Um, looking squeaky clean, looking clean, looking good, looking looking reputable um, in order to track the money. And that's what it's about at the end of the day. So when he says these places are not tax havens anymore, it's rubbish, absolute rubbish. <laughs>